This is going to be an overview of the book of Mark. Now, historically, the gospel of Mark shows you Jesus Christ as a servant. Matthew showed you Jesus Christ as king. But now we're going to see him as a servant. In Philippians 2, 7, it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Romans 15, 3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know that filthy uh, Coming to America movie about a rich man leaving home to become a poor man and find his bride? They completely stole their plot from the King James Bible. Jesus left heaven and his riches to become poor and save his bride. He comes as a servant, and that's what the book of Mark shows us. The gospel of Mark shows us that. Mark has 678 verses around 15,171 words. I say around because I didn't count it. And it's got 16 chapters. The author is obviously Mark. And doctrinally, you have partial fulfillment of the coming king because this talks about his first coming. Devotionally, you need to realize that you should follow in the Lord's steps and serve others. Be a servant to the Lord and serve others. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And if Jesus Christ was his servant, we need to follow in his steps. In chapter 1, it starts out with John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be your focus. You should be a modern-day John the Baptist preparing the way for his second coming. Letting people know that the rapture is on the way. Letting people know that the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ is on the way and that a seven-year tribulation period is coming. And then the Lord's coming down in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. But John the Baptist comes preaching. And Jesus gets baptized by John. And John sees and hears the Godhead right before his eyes. And there is no doubt where John stood on the Godhead. He was not a oneness Pentecostal. He wasn't a part of the oneness movement. He wasn't an Arian. He believed in a one in three, three in one God. In Mark 1, 10 through 11, it says, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Lord Jesus is getting baptized and straightway coming up out of the water, John the Baptist saw the heavens open and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And in a voice from heaven, there's the Father, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There you have all three of the Godhead, one God, three persons. But the Lord Jesus is then led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. He fasts and prays and he endures temptation. And I guarantee you he was reading scripture because that's what he quoted to the devil when he was tempted by him there in the wilderness. And you also see John gets put in prison for preaching it straight, which that's probably what's about to happen to us. But in Mark 1, 14 and 15, now after that John was put in prison and Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, notice that even though John was put in prison, Jesus still preached. He still went around saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. He didn't back off. He scooted up and kept preaching even harder. In chapter 2, Jesus healed heals the paralytic he calls levi to be a disciple and he deals with the pharisees accusing him of breaking the sabbath in chapter 3 jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the sabbath day in mark three eleven through 12 it says an unclean spirits when they saw him fell down before him and cried saying thou art the son of god and straightly charged them that they should not make him known but the Pharisees, they accused Jesus of casting out these devils by the power of the devil. 
in verse 28, it says, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin, was then saying he hath an unclean spirit. Notice verse 30, Because they said... He hath an unclean spirit. This doesn't happen today. This can't happen today. There is no sin that is unpardonable. The only way you will, you would be uneligible to be saved is if you die without believing on Jesus Christ. But while there's breath, there's hope. You can't do the blasphemy challenge to where you lose your opportunity to be saved. There is no sin like that today. In Mark 4, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. When the sower went out to sow, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls devoured it up. Now this represents Satan taking it out of their hearts. Some fell on stony ground and sprang up because it had no depth of earth. So when the sun was up, it was scorched. It had no root, so it withered away. This represents those who have no root in themselves, and when persecution arises, they don't endure. Some fell on thorns and were choked. This represents those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of this world keep them from doing anything. And then some fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased. This represents those who hear and accept the words it gets in their heart. They go on to live for the Lord and live a victorious Christian life. Now Mark 4, 33 and 34, And with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Imagine having Jesus Christ personally expound all things to you. At the end of chapter 4, Jesus is asleep in the bottom of a ship, and the waves and the wind are beating against it. The disciples are scared, and they go to wake up the Lord, and he calms the storm. All they had to do was go to Jesus, and he took care of the storm. They went down low to get to Jesus Christ, and then he took care of the situation. If you humble yourself and get down low and pray, Jesus will hear from heaven and calm the storm. In chapter 5, you have the famous chapter of the Lord Jesus Christ casting out devils. And here are some characteristics of a devil-possessed person, according to chapter 5 here. One of the things you see is that he was obsessed with death. He was dwelling among the tombs. Another thing you see about him is that no man could bind him with chains, so he's got supernatural strength. He was out of control. No man could tame him. He didn't sleep right. Night and day, he was in the mountains. He was very emotional and self-absorbed, crying and cutting himself with stones. He's got a different kind of obsession with Jesus Christ than a Christian has because he ran and worshipped Jesus. And multiple, multiple devils can be in a person at a time. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. So that's some marks of a devil-possessed person. And I wouldn't say someone is devil-possessed just because they have a few of those. They would need, you know, most of them. <clears throat> but in chapter 6, Jesus went back into his own country. And this is where people knew him. And this is where he's rejected. And in Mark 6, 3 and six, through 6, it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Hosea and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do my, no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. So it can be hard to win people to the Lord that you have known very well for a long time. The people knew Jesus. They knew his mother, his brother, his sisters. They knew Mary's husband, Joseph. He was just that boy who lived up the road to them. And many times somebody gets saved and they try to witness to their family and it's hard for their own family to listen to them. The more a person knows you, the harder it can be to witness to that person, especially if they knew you as a lost person. 
it can be hard to witness to your parents because they've they've known you your whole life. They've had to discipline you and get on to you for the bad things that you've done. And now here you are, you're coming to them telling them that they're a sinner and that they need to get saved. Witnessing to family and to people that know you and your family, that can be tough. Just like it was tough for Jesus here. In chapter 6, Jesus sends his disciples out two by two. He gave them power over unclean spirits. He, he gave them the gift of healing. They go out preaching and they confirm the word with signs. And the Lord gave them a job and they did it. The Lord has given us a job. He wants us to go out and give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says in Mark 6, 8, And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse. He told them to just take their staff. All you need is your weapon, your King James Bible. When Herod hears about Jesus Christ, he thinks that it's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Herod had John killed because he was pushed to do so by his wife Herodias and their daughter. Herodias' daughter danced before him and he said he would give her anything. So she asked for the head of John the Baptist because that's what her mother wanted. That's what her mother told her to ask for. Her mother, Herodias. You know, a lot of mothers are leading their daughter the wrong way. And her mother, Herodias, was mad at John because he said it, it, was, it wasn't lawful for Herod to have Herodias because she was actually his brother Philip's wife. So she wanted John the Baptist head in a charger. She led her daughter the wrong way. She made her daughter hate the preacher. That's a shame that a mother would lead her daughter on a path to hell like that. But it happens every day. A mother will listen to wicked music. She'll wear wicked clothes. She'll cuss and drink and sleep around and everything else in front of her daughter. And make her twice the hoe that she is. And in chapter 7, you see a mark of the Pharisee. The Pharisees were all worried about the disciples not washing their hands before they eat. Yet the Pharisees were sick and twisted on the inside. You know, it's like today. These, these people will come in, they'll say, where's your mask? Yet they got filthy uh, cuss words coming out of their mouth. They're worried about little bitty germs getting in, but they're not worried about these big long cuss words coming out. I mean, I've had this kind of stuff happen at work. I'll be eating a sandwich, and my hands are kind of black and dirty from working. And some of the men will look at me in disgust for not wash washing my hands. Yet they cuss up a storm. Their mouth is dirty, and they wash their hands. They wash their hands real good before they eat, but then they say dirty jokes, and they cuss. The truth is, I should have washed my hands. That's true. But the more important thing is, they should wash their filthy mouth. In Mark seven twenty through 23, it says, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So, it's not about what's going in so much as it is what's coming out so much. Many times a man's advice is right. He just says it with hypocrisy. So if the advice he gave me is right, then I should take his advice even though he's doing a lot of other things that's much more wrong than I'm doing and he has no business giving me unsought advice. That's how you handle a Pharisee. If what he's telling you to do is the right thing to do, you should do it even though... He's probably not doing it himself. In Mark 7, 2, it says, And when they saw some of his disciples eat with bread, eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. Sometimes men will find fault with you no matter what you do. You can't please everybody, and you shouldn't want to. But at the end of chapter 7, the Lord causes a deaf man to both hear and to speak. And Jesus Christ would put a hearing aid company out of business. He would cause an optometrist to have to go back to school for something else. The funeral directors would, have, would, have, would just have to starve to death because nobody would die when Jesus was around. In chapter 8, Jesus foretells of his death and resurrection. Have you ever heard someone say that 
You don't want to know how and when you die because it would just drive you crazy. Well, Jesus knew both. He knew how and when he was going to die. And he constantly tells the disciples. It says in Mark 8, 31 through 33, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou serverest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So the disciples didn't understand the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection when it was presented to them. The Old Testament saints were not looking forward to the cross. They were looking forward to the kingdom. They weren't looking for a crown of thorns. They were looking for him to have on a king's crown. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. But look at the next chapter. If you still think the saints from the Old Testament were looking forward to the gospel that me and you believe today, Mark 9, 31 through 32 says, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So they didn't understand the gospel. They weren't looking forward to the cross. They had no idea what Jesus was talking about when he gave them the gospel. Now get a taste of what Jesus Christ hellfire preaching is like. In Mark 9, 42, it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Jesus Christ preached on hell very frequently. My pastor preaches on hell like three times a year at least. He'll preach it on Mother's Day weekend. He'll preach it on Easter Sunday. When you find out hell is real, it does something to you. In the lake of fire, your worm dieth not. Some people say, well, that's your conscience that keeps going. And I believe it keeps going. Some people say everybody will have worms on them, eating them. I believe that, but in Isaiah 66, 23 through 24, it says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So what you have here is in the millennium, when these people of the other nations come to Jerusalem to worship the great king at the Feast of Tabernacles, they're going to go forth and see the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against the Lord. And this will be a deterrent to crime. They're going to be in a literal lake of fire on earth, a literal hell on earth, where the fire's not quenched. And they have a body like their father. I believe the worm that dieth not is the carcasses of the men the lost men in that lake of fire. We get a body like the Lord Jesus, but they get a body like their father, the devil, a serpent-like creature. In chapter 10, Jesus Christ lays out marriage very clear. It says in Mark 10, 6 through 9, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So he lays it out. A man shall leave his father and mother. He needs to cleave to his wife. It's between a man and a woman. Between one man and one woman. And he says in First. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 
What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. You need to stay with your wife. When you step out on your wife and sleep with someone else, you become one flesh with that harlot. A woman that will get with a married man is nothing but a home-wrecking hoe. And a man that flirts and tries to get with a married woman is a slithery snake. In Mark 10, 25, it says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. There is a wicked country song called, I don't know what it's called, but some of the words is like, money can't buy everything, but it can buy me a boat, it can buy me a truck, it can buy me a gun, and so on. And in the song, he says he knows it's the root of all evil and that you can't get a camel through an eye of a needle. So this man is a fool. How do you get to a place where you can make light of the word of God for a stupid song? When you start loving money, that's when that will happen. So he did a song mocking what God said about money, and it was all for the love of money. These country singers are more out of hell than Marilyn Manson. It's just packaged different. The devil's he he's got a the devil has a package for every class of sinner. Every sinner needs a different package. He's got country for some of them. He's got rock music for some of them. For me, it was rock and metal. For some people, he's got rap. But Jesus foretells his death a third time in Mark ten thirty three through thirty four, saying, "Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again." So there is the death, burial, and resurrection. He died on the cross shed his blood, was buried, and resurrected. And in Mark 11, you have the triumphal entry. This is also where you have the famous story of Jesus Christ getting angry with people. He came in, he flipped their tables over. This was like something out of an action movie. I believe Jesus Christ was a strong, rough-looking character. In Isaiah 53, 2, it said, There is no beauty that we should desire him. I don't believe he looked like the paintings. We know he had a beard because they plucked it off of him. And contrary to what a lot of people think, I believe he had long hair. In Leviticus 19.27, it shows us that under the law, they weren't supposed to cut their hair. But he, he, didn't, he didn't have his hair up in no man bun. I guarantee you that. He didn't have that thing in some big ponytail on top of his head. He was a manly man. This was a manly man's long hair. <clears throat> it wasn't until Paul gave instructions to the church that he said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And if a man has long hair today, then he should get it cut, according to Paul. But Jesus wasn't living under, you know, Paul's epistles. In Mark eleven seventeen, it says, And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. He came through and overthrew all those tables of people selling in the temple. They made it into a den of thieves. And one year at the MTV movies or music awards, when it went to commercial breaks, it would show doors closing and it said, Den of Thieves. And every now and then, the lost world will be honest about where they stand spiritually. They are a den of thieves. Now, in chapter 12, Jesus tells the parable of a certain man who had a vineyard, and he let it out to husbandmen, and he kept sending servants to, to get the fruit of the vineyard. And they would kill the servants. Finally, he sends his son, and, they think, and he thinks, well, they'll reverence my son. But they kill him so that they can get the inheritance. This was Jesus Christ rebuking the wicked Pharisees with this parable, and they knew it. And because they knew that in the story he was the son that they wanted to kill. They wanted to kill him because they knew the story was about them. Now, in chapter 13, the Lord gives the signs of the end. And he talks about false Christs, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famines, persecution, 
the abomination of desolation, false Christs and false prophets show signs and lying wonders, but the real Jesus is going to stand up. In Mark 13, 25 through 26, it says, And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's what's going to happen. Everything he says is going to come to pass. Then in chapter 14, you have the plot to kill Jesus. And Judas is going to betray him. And in this great chapter, the Lord foretells Peter's denial. You know, the famous story about Peter denying Jesus three times. And you don't want to be like Judas, the traitor, the betrayer, the sellout. Don't sell out your Christian life for temporary material wealth. Don't be like Peter in this instance. I don't think Peter was scared. I don't think he was denying Jesus, who Jesus was out of fear. or I don't think he was denying that he knew Jesus out of fear. I, I think he was wanting to fight them so that they couldn't get Jesus. So he was upset with Jesus is why he denied him. He, I mean, he cut off a man's ear first thing with his sword. He cut off the ear of Malchus. You know, he was ready to fight. He wasn't afraid. He was upset. So he denied Jesus. Then in chapter 15, Jesus is delivered to Pilate. Pilate delivers him to be crucified. Jesus is mocked, and you have the crucifixion. And this is where you have, in Ephesians 2, 16, it says and that he might reconcile both into, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. This is where the way into the body of Christ was made possible. And there, this is where you have the beginning of the New Testament. Because in Hebrews 9.16, it says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the New Testament doesn't actually even start until Jesus Christ dies on the cross. All, the, all that we've talked about before this time, it was Old Testament still. And then in chapter 16, in this chapter, you have the resurrection of Jesus. You have him giving the commission to the disciples. And it says in Mark 16, 14, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Notice that the disciples were so clueless about Jesus Christ dying and resurrecting that they didn't even believe it when they were told he was risen. And it says in verse 15 and 16, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now this is one of the favorite verses for the church of Christ, the cult called the church of, that they call themselves the church of Christ. However, notice the last half of the verse. It says, But he that believeth not shall be damned. They like the first part of the verse that says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But look at the last half. But he that believeth not shall be damned. It's the ones that don't believe that's damned. Now you are going to see the sign gifts of the apostles also in this chapter. And Mark 16, 17 through 20, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Notice the purpose of signs were to confirm the word with signs following. Just like Moses confirmed to Israel that he was sent from God by throwing down his rod and it became a serpent. The signs are for the unbelieving Jews, according to 1 Corinthians one twenty two, And tongues are for a sign to unbelievers, according to 1 Corinthians 14.22. The signs are not to show how spiritual you are. They're to confirm the word with signs following. And they're to confirm the word specifically to Jews, to unbelieving Jews. They're not for the church at all. So all this stuff you see today in churches, people snake handling, people claiming to heal people, people claiming to speak in tongues and cast out devils. They're trying to counterfeit the signs that, that Jesus gave the apostles here in Mark 16. But this has been an overview of the book of Mark.